Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining today. Um, today's presentation is by Dr. Shelley Chavis. Um, just a little bit of background about Dr. Chavis. She is um, a veterinarian that has served as the District 3 vet for the Indiana State Board of Animal Health since 1999, and she graduated from the Purdue College of Veterinary Medicine in 1997. Her day-to-day -day duties involve animal welfare investigations, emergency preparedness, disease traceability, and public health. Dr. Chavis directs BOA's Servid Health and Chronic Wasting Disease Programs, and she uses that experience as a vice chairperson for the Farm Servid Committee for the U.S. Animal Health Association. So today, Dr. Chavis is going to present on, oh dear, an update on Indiana's Servid Program, and thank you so much, Dr. Chavis. I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Macy. Um, and then I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes or so, and halfway through this uh, presentation, then Dr. Glom is going to talk with us about specific, uh, more specific cervid diseases, so you can look forward to, to hearing her also. Um, just to give a little bit of um, background on the CVD program and, and history with cervids with the Board of Animal Health, um, it goes back to 1998 when we first adopted rules for TB control and cervids. And, um, and then in 2001 is when we started registering elk herds for chronic wasting disease. And we just had a, a general monitoring program. And this uh, started when the industry, the elk industry came to the Board of Animal Health and they requested um, a way to gain CWD status for interstate movement because some other, other states were starting to require a, a certified status or that they be in some type of monitoring program. So we started that and then in 2002, um, then we had our first positive CWD case um, in Wisconsin before it had been in uh, Colorado, Wyoming area. And so when that started, we put a moratorium on all cervid imports. And so we just put a stop to it. What's going on? How did we get chronic wasting disease in Wisconsin? We had some uh, trace imports that we dealt with and just kind of waited to see what was going on. During that time, we also started registering all cervids um, into the CWD, the, the, a monitoring program, a general program. So then in 2003, um, we adopted new rules to replace the moratorium and uh, on cervid imports. And so these new rules, they, uh, they put import restrictions on live animals, embryos, and semen. And the live embryo restriction, the live animal restrictions are still the same today uh, as they were that, that we started with back in 2003. We have not changed that for live animal. Um, they're pretty much that if an animal, to be able to import into the state of Indiana, they have to come, they're only allowed to come from a state for CWD susceptible animals, which we'll talk about here in a minute, um, that has not had chronic wasting disease in the last five years for um, wild or farm raised cervids. And that's that's probably been the rule that has saved us the most as far as our, our imports and why we don't have CWD to this point in our farm raised cervids. So that import restriction went into, it became a permanent rule. And then we also had restrictions. We had pre-entry uh, requirements, permits on embryos and semen, and that then changed later on. During 2002, 2003, we also did a statewide hunter harvest surveillance. And during this time with DNR, uh, we collected 3,300 samples. 1,100 of those were tested, the rest were banked, and it was to determine if CWD existed um, at an incidence of 0.3% at a 95% confidence. And so none was found at that time. Then in 2008, we had a, a program change and a director change. So this is um, <laughs> for better or for worse, when I became the director of the Chronic Wasting Disease Program for the Board of Animal Health. And at that time, um, the way the program had been going, we had a general program, but there, there were very two very distinct uh, groups of people. We had the people that were in it, they just had pets, they weren't interested in moving interstate, being in the commercial business. And then we had those that that did want to have status and and be able to move interstate. And so enforcement wise and just dealing with the program, it just started to make more sense to divide those groups. Then we also said, well, we've got these deer that we're pretty sure are non-susceptible to CWD based on various um, research projects and, and what uh, USDA recognizes also as CWD susceptible versus non-susceptible. And so we divided them that way first. We said our CWD non-susceptible animals, 
uh, the fallow axis deer in the muntjac that we know at the time and the way they're classified. We're just going to require them to have a premises ID so we know where they're at. And then if it would ever change that they become a susceptible species, we would be able to find them and, and have them join a program. And by non-susceptible, we were kind of using that if they have not gotten CWD in a natural setting, in a natural environment. So even though we know muttjack, um, the intracerebrally, it can be injected, um, the prions can, they, they can show clinical signs, but they haven't got it in a, in a natural environment setting. So that's what we kind of used as our, as our determining factor. Back in 2008, reindeer were still considered non-susceptible, and then reindeer have since moved under CWD susceptible because they did get it in a, in a natural environment and setting in, in northern Illinois. So our CWD susceptible list in Indiana, the elk, um, we don't have wapiti, but red deer, cyca, mule deer, white tails, moose, reindeer, and the hybrids of those. And then for the CWD susceptible animals, we said, okay, now we need to divide those to those that are in the... Um, that want to move interstate and want to be in the commercial business, those are going to be required to be in a certification program, and the others will just be our registered, which is closer to a pet type program, and will have lesser requirements. And at the time, we modeled the certification program um, after the rumors we were hearing that USDA was going to start a federal program. So once we did that, then uh, we were able to start moving along with the requirements for each. So the registered program. Um, you have to have a premises ID, uh, be registered with the Board of Animal Health. And these are, like I said, for the uh, CWD susceptible species. They have to be in either the certified program or the registered program. The registered program here has the um, less requirements. And so they've, they've got the annual inventory and inspection still. Um, identification is required at the earliest opportunity. So people that have a herd of deer, uh, you know, 20, 30 deer that are far, fenced in, but they aren't catching them up and doing anything with them, they might not have identification. And that's for the registered program. They do not meet interstate movement requirements and they are not required to sample um, deer that die over a year of age for chronic wasting disease. And the CWD registered herd program includes our pet herds and our hunting preserves. The certification program modeled after um, what we knew was coming down from USDA then requires uh, the premises ID, the annual inventory inspection, official ear tag, and a secondary unique ID, and those are required by one year of age. CWD sampling is required for all animals over one year of age that die or are harvested on the farm, and, these, and, and they meet the USDA herd certification requirements for interstate movement. So in 2012, um, USDA uh, published their final rule for CWD interstate uh, movement requirements. And then they also had requirements for moving to slaughter, for animals captured for movement and release, and for research animals were also included in that final rule. And then in 2012, the program standards were finalized also then. And these are guidelines um, from USDA for meeting these herd certification program requirements that we follow. They were revised then in 2019 and currently USDA is holding listening sessions for possible revision again on these program standards. Semen and embryos in 2008, we um, removed the pre-entry requirement for those. Um, before that, we still had uh, permits that were required on that. Semen and embryos are not restricted by the state CWD status, so they can come in from states that have chronic wasting disease, um, but they are not allowed to come from a CWD positive animal, suspect, exposed, or any, any epidemiologically linked animal, not from a premises where CWD positive animal has resided resided in the last 60 months. So they, they pretty much cannot be epi linked at all to CWD um, to bring in semen or, or eggs from a, a farm. So semen and embryos are not restricted in the federal regulations. And this allows for you know selective breeding for our herds um, and, and during auctions where we do not have the live animals and because of our live animal restrictions are, are pretty, pretty strict. Carcass import restrictions, we get a lot of questions about this for um, carcasses coming in from out of state for people that go out to hunt. And carcasses um, can come in if they have the head, spinal cord, and small intestines removed without any further restrictions. 
if a carcass is coming in that has the head, spinal cord, small intestine, then they have to be uh, delivered within 72 hours to either a meat processor inspected under state or federal regulations, a commercial deer processor registered with DNR, or a taxidermist licensed by DNR. You can move in antlers, um, including skull caps, as long as it's cleaned of all brain and muscle tissue, hides, upper canine teeth, and finished taxiderm taxidermist mounts are also allowed to come in. Something that comes up quite a bit in uh, in Indiana and in discussions is how they're, how farm cervids are classified. Um, they are classified as livestock in Indiana. So under they are subject to the Board of Animal Health meat inspection laws because they're considered an amenable species, the same as a, a cow or a, a goat. And so inspection is required on them for meat for sale. So they cannot be donated to um, organizations like uh, Feed the Hungry and, and those kind of things where you can donate wild harvested uh, deer because they are not considered a, a, a wild animal. They are classified as livestock. It, this applies to the cervids that are harvested on our licensed hunting preserves. So those also are farm raised cervids. So owners and hunters are allowed to harvest their deer um, for their own household, the whole friends and family without inspection, but the meat cannot be um, sold or, or donated without being slaughtered under inspection. As of March 2016, the Board of Animal Health, um, a license is required for uh, hunting preserves. And so before that, the hunting preserves were operating under an injunction um, with DNR. And then in 2016, they became legal as long as they have a license through the Board of Animal Health. Um, the CWD registered herd program standards apply along with CWD sampling being required. So they do have annual inspections, fence inspections, and they have to have records on um, all animals, official ID, secondary ID going into the preserve, and then all animals harvested, um, died that, that we find um, uh, coming off the preserve. They have to keep track of any uh, uh, treatments and sedation going into the preserve. Also, they have those kind of record keeping requirements. And then CWD sampling is required on everything over a year of age on the susceptible CWD susceptible species. There's a hundred acre minimum requirement for our hunting preserves. Um, we have two preserves grandfathered in at less than a hundred acres, but any new ones do require the hundred acres that the deer have access to during the hunting time. Hunting is allowed September 1st through March 1st. And um, any weapon that's legal under DNR, legal on Indiana property, uh, private, public, is allowed during that time to be used on the hunting preserves. And there's a map of our current hunting preserves. Right now we currently have 15, we were up to 17, then two went out of business. We've got others in the works, others on the works to go out of, out of business. So it seems like it's a, a pretty kind of stabilized at about 15. And you can see they're spread from Northern Indi Indiana to Southern Indiana. The whole, the whole gamut. This is a map of our participating farms, cervid farms. And you can see according to the legend, the, the green dots are our CWD program certified herds and the blue dots are our program, our registered pet herds. And as you can see, Northern Indiana is a little heavy on the, on the certified herds compared to Southern Indiana. Just to give you an idea on numbers, our certification herds, we've got about 200 herds, <clears throat> um, which, Runs about six, 7,000 uh, head of deer. And then our registered herds, 43. Um, hunting preserves, 15. And then our pet herds. The classification between the pet herds versus the registered herds, if they're classified as a strict pet, those are ant those should be herds that are not really uh, breeding, buying, and selling. They have you know, maybe two does or even one one pet. And that's, that's all they, they just keep it as a pet. There's no movement on and off the farms. Our species, our herds consist primarily of white-tailed deer. Um, our other herds, we have elk, fallow, syca, muttjack, red deer, axis, reindeer, and mule deer, and some hybrids thereof. Give you an idea on imports. Uh, before 2018, just to let you know, our import number was, was actually quite a bit higher. It could be in the couple hundreds. But once some of the more restrictions came into play, more states came down with CWD, our import numbers dropped off. The higher numbers in 2000 uh, and 2022 primarily are due to fallow deer. We've had a lot of fallow have become the hot ticket item lately. So that's 
the increase on the cervids, and they can get them from states that have chronic wasting disease, so it makes them a little easier to import into the state. Exports dropped off just a hair from where they were initially. Um, I think this is due to we got more hunting preserves, and so people were selling in-state. It was easier. Um, our number of deer really haven't changed that much, so I, I feel like it's because more went in-state than out-of-state. Our certification program sampled 729 deer last year. Our hunting preserves did 418. And you can compare that to DNR did um, 935 last year for chronic wasting disease. Those are primarily um, uh, during the harvest season and then roadkill and, and some targeted, but mostly it's, it's what they find as far as uh, more passive surveillance. They target different counties each year for increased surveillance. Uh, the plan is to target north central Indiana this uh, coming up hunting season. They've done northeast, they've done northwest. Um, and so I'll show you a map here in the next slide that shows that if CWD was in the county at the prevalence at or above the percentage listed, we would have been able to detect it. So you can see on the map where, where the majority of sampling has been done and what, what detection rates they have. And you can find that on DNR's website, if you have an interest in that. Um, other cervid diseases, just to talk a little bit about uh, EHD. Every year I get a call saying, oh, we've got CWD in the state. And every year I say, it's probably EHD. <laughs> no, and every year it's probably EHD and so they confuse those three, three letters. So uh, EHD we do get every year um, in some amount of uh, level of infection. So EHD, epizootic hemorrhagic disease, it's an acute infectious, often fatal viral disease of white-tailed deer. It affects white-tailed deer. Um, I think it can affect fallow and elk, but boy, we just don't see it as much. Um, I haven't ever heard it can't infect them, but but we don't, it's mostly, we mostly see it in white tail. Less commonly and, and rarely fatal, it can also affect sheep, goats, and cattle. And so we often, sometimes get reports of that also. It's transmitted by biting midges, Hulocoides flies. And we primarily see it late July through um, early November. So it's just starting to ramp up. We haven't had any confirmed cases. We've got some at the lab right now um, to see if it was. So we've, we're have we starting to get the reports coming in, but nothing confirmed yet. And it is, it's quite indistinguishable from blue tongue. Wait, where is my, oh, there we go. Uh, the clinical signs for EHD, uh, a lot of times with the deer, they, a lot of times we see sudden death. Often they just kind of look a little uh, lethargic and the next day they're dead. But um, depending on the strain, um, there's several strains of it. A lot, most of the time we, we're seeing strain uh, two, seen some six and one. And it seems like some of the strains, the deer can last about a week before they die. Um, and you might see more of the clinical signs as far as the swollen jaws, neck, tongue, the swollen around the eyes the conjunctival hyperemia, blood from the nose, mouth, eyes, rectum, um, severe dyspnea. These, these deer run a high fever, uh, so you, they'll be depressed, anorexic, they can slough hooves, and a lot of times you'll find them near water um, because of the, the high fever, they seek out the water for relief. On necropsy, we find red, heavy, wet lungs, blood in the intestine, and hemorrhages in various tissues. EHD prevention, uh, a lot of guys do control the insect population, um, various sprays and foggers that way, prevent areas of standing water. Um, there's a, a school of thought out there for ivermectin and antiviral use that way. Uh, some natural genetic resistance that some people see in their deer and then vaccination. MedGene does have a vaccine. I believe Newport has one too. I had some stats on the MedGene vaccine. It's a killed vaccine. And the mortality rate <clears throat> on their studies actually went from almost 27% down to less than 2% with proper use. <clears throat> we'll get a lot of guys that I'll, I'll hear reports of saying, well, I vaccinated for EHD, but it, I still got it. Well, they probably gave one dose is what I, I hear most of the time. Um, it's a two-dose vaccine, like most other vaccines, initially two, three weeks apart. Um, the pregnant dose 30 days before fawning and then vaccinating the fawns uh, three to four months after they're weaned and the passive immunity is starting to wane and prior to the EHD season is what's recommended. Um, in Indiana, before 2019, the, the last major outbreak was 2012 with a less significant one in 2013. 
Um, 20, and then in 2021, we had small pockets in Southwest and Northeast Indiana, a VHD that was a little more significant than other areas of the state. And then last year, we had a more significant outbreak in Central and South Central Indiana. Look a little bit more on chronic wasting disease as far as the distribution. It's now been found in 31 states and four Canadian provinces. Um, the wild cervids, 30 states and three provinces. So there's a little overlap you can see there for the provinces, but the farm cervids, 18 states and, and three provinces. And this uh, map you can always find, they keep it updated really well on um, USGS. <clears throat> and you can see the dark gray, which is where chronic wasting disease was um, prior to 2000. See it out there, Wyoming, Colorado. And the yellow dots are the CWD that's been depopulated in the farm raised facilities. The lighter gray, moderate gray, um, is the CWD in known free range populations. And then the red dots are where CWD is current in farm raised facilities. And you can see it's conspicuously absent in Indiana and Kentucky, which we, which we like it that way. Um, here's our map for imports. So, uh, in Indiana, you cannot import cervids into Indiana, and actually not into Kentucky either. <laughs> Kentucky, uh, their rule is if they've had a, if there's been a case of chronic wasting disease ever, they cannot import, um, which would knock off New York for Kentucky. They can't import from New York either. Our rule says if they haven't had a case in the last five years in farm raised or wild, that you can import into Indiana. And so that. Um, is where we're sitting as far as where we can. We've brought in some red deer, oh, from Maine and uh, New York. We've brought some reindeer in from New York. We just brought a whitetail in from New York. Um, then we get whitetail from Kentucky and reindeer from Alaska. And that's pretty much about, and then, like I said, the fallow, but this, the fallow can import from any state, like I said. As far as where CDBD is at, how far is it from us? Um, in 2020, it was detected about 60 miles from the Indiana state line in Ohio, Wyandotte County. And then in 2018, it was about 30 miles from the Indiana state line in Jackson County, Michigan. I mean, that was that was five years ago, so it's, it's probably a little closer now. Um, in Illinois, it has been diagnosed. We've had a couple of cases within 25 miles from the Indiana state line since 2017. And those cases in Illinois just kind of seem to be trucking south. Um, luckily, they haven't, they don't seem to be moving east a lot. So hopefully they continue to do that. Um, in 2022-23, uh, the fiscal year, the October to October that USDA uses, there have been 28 farm servid herds detected positive um, for CWD. Uh, USDA likes to point out that less than 1% of the herds in the CWD herd certification program have been found to have CWD. And that's just a breakdown of the states where the, the positive herds, I, I had this in order originally, but then Texas seem, keeps adding. In fact, I think Texas has a couple more actually to add to that number now also. So lately the positives have pretty much been in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Texas, uh, Michigan actually just added another one in the last month. So you can see the breakdown that way. And uh, internationally, uh, there's been a, a novel moose strain in Finland found for CWD. This is a, the, the CWD prions, um, in Norway are distinct from the ones in North America. They're, they found a variety of strains among the Nordic cervids, whereas in North America, the deer, elk, and moose are relatively consistent in their CWD strain profiles, and there is no clear explanation why. Just to let you know, also, we've had, we're receiving cooperative agreement funding. Uh, just over 12 million has been provided by APHIS, and that's for the farm-raised and um, wild cervids. So I think about 6.1 million would be for the farm raised to develop and implement CWD management and response activities. Those applications were due June 12th and are currently in the review process. So Indiana did put in an application. Oh, right there for, um, we applied for the max for uh, one time funding was for the 250,000. And that would test uh, just, well over probably 3,000 white-tailed deer and approximately, which is approximately half of the Indiana farm-raised survey population. To go back a slide, 
So what we put in the money for was to um, get testing done for genomic predictions for selective breeding. So they have found that CWD is a, a highly heritable polygenic trait. So there's no one allele that makes the deer resistant or um, susceptible to chronic wasting disease, uh, unlike they, what they had with the Scrapey program. They found it to be a, a, a group of, of alleles and that, 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 that have to do with the differential, differential susceptibility to CWD. So with these resistant alleles, they can test for those and they can see how many a deer has of these and produce a, what they call a GEBV, a genomically estimated breeding value. The more negative the value, the more resistant the deer is to chronic wasting disease. And so if producers know um, this value, then they can use that for selective breeding and for um, culling animals. And to, so the goal is to, to get a more resistant deer herd and reduce the prevalence of CWD through that. So like I said, we'd be able to test um, about half of our, our white-tailed deer population. It's only for white-tailed deer. Um, it is not approved for the other cervids yet. They don't have the kind of research done for those. So just for the white tail, um, it's $75 per white tail deer for the DNA and the 50,000 SNPs, which is the, the group of alleles. And so we're hoping to get that going later this fall. Um, I'm going to skip through the trace work because I knew I wasn't going to have time for that. And just to do a few more updates, just to let you know, CWD cost the federal government an estimated $280 million from 2000 to 2021. In 2020 alone, state governments spent $25 million on CWD. And states with chronic wasting disease spend on average eight times more dealing with the disease. Um, and it affects the local and regional um, economies with the servant farmer, and then also the hunting industry is affected with the outfitters, land leases, taxidermists, and the processors. CVD, uh, the prions can persist in the environment. They've shown for at least 15 years. Um, let's be realistic, it's probably even longer. They do maintain their, the prions maintain infectivity, and small amounts uh, of it cause the disease. They have done some studies that the last uh, Fourth International CWD trans Symposium I was at to show that the transport in landfill material is not very likely. So I thought that was kind of a good thing to know. There are different strains of CWD and they can have different host ranges. Um, and this is all on a research basis. So no, our, our, um, our cats and dogs aren't out there getting CWD, but they have shown transmission, transmission and passage through a secondary host can change the host range and possibly increase susceptibility to other species. So there's been a lot of research going on that way. The last thing I'm going to talk about is just a, an emerging deer disease that they talked about one of the conferences I was at, uh, deer pox virus. Um, it, it's been around, it's not a, a new disease, but they are starting to see more of it. Um, this has mostly been down in Florida. It does not mutate very fast. Um, you'll see here though, the main reason we're <clears throat> We like to mention it is because the symptoms are vesicles. And so as a regulatory agency, anytime we have a disease and the clinical signs are vesicles, we get a little excited because it looks like so many other diseases that we're worried about. But vesicles, blisters on the skin that burst, developing ulcers with crust along the edge, hair loss, weight loss, internal ulcers and fawns, especially the esophagus and the rumen. They will lose immunity over time once they get some immunity from the virus. They're looking at rodents and insects as mechanical um, transmission vectors. There were 80 suspected cases in Florida, um, 28 of those were actual cases in adult deer and fawns. And then they find that pox virus in, in many organs throughout the deer, but primarily in the liver, the lung and spleen. And I will finish with some pretty pictures of deer affected with these. And you can see how similar that can, can look to our foot and mouth and Secular stomatitis and other diseases that we get excited about. There's my contact information. If you ever have questions, feel free to call me, text me. I guess I don't have my specific email up there, but I can get that to you also. Yeah, and we can thank you so much, Dr. Chavis. Um, we can definitely put that in the chat as well for everyone um, at the end of this webinar. So thank you for an awesome presentation. Um, we are now going to introduce Dr. Glom. Uh, 
Dr. Glom, Dr. Jessica Glom is a veterinarian at the Countryside Veterinary Hospital in Wabash, Indiana. She graduated from Michigan State um, in 2017, and she also has several deer clients that she works with on a regular basis. Um, so she's going to talk to us a little bit about, and it looks like we can see your screen. Thank you so much, Dr. Glom, take it away. All right, thank you. And let me know if the slides aren't advancing. So like, like she said, I'm going to go over some common and emerging diseases. And of course, as Shelly was talking, she went a little more detail than I thought she would on a couple. So I added a few slides from other lectures. So I'm sorry that's not all homogeneous, but I added some more good stuff. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was cheek impaction of fawn. It's one of the leading causes in fawn death. Um, it can be either a single event or a chronic event. The chronic impactions can lead to pressure necrosis of the cheek as more and more feed gets impacted in there, ultimately causing tooth loss, bone infections, and sometimes death. Um, the causes are usually multifactorial, but the most common causes are either arterial worms or infections primarily with fusobacterium. Other optional causes, other alternative causes are meningeal worm. Usually the migration through cranial nerve causes cranial nerve defects and malalignment of teeth or simple injuries. And the most common isolates are Fusobacterium necroforum or Fusobacteria varium. Um, note that the Fusobacterium itself cannot enter normal healthy tissue. There usually has to be a break in the tissue for it to colonize. The suspected pathogenesis in FAWS is usually either when their teeth start erupting, it causes microabrasions in those mucous membranes, which does allow for the bacteria to enter. Um, other options are when fawns start mouthing objects or start eating solid food and eat things like sticks and whatnot that can cause abrasions in their mouth, allowing the bacteria to enter. And once the bacteria has spread to bone, it usually becomes fatal. Some management to work that in your farmed herds is a lot of times people and they anesthetize the deer, flush all the bacteria out, and treat them with long acting and long acting antimicrobials such as penicillin. Well, that's not long acting, but <laughs> exceeds or penicillin injections. Um, pneumonia is another common disease, just like in all of our other livestock species. In cervids, the most common isolate is also Fusobacterium. In this case, it's Varium. This isotype specifically does not contain a leukotoxin gene, which is the primary virulence factor in most of the other Fusobacterium species. This does suggest that Fusobacterium is not necessarily the primary inciting pathogen, but rather one of either overgrowth or a secondary opportunistic pathogen. Truparella pyogens is also another common isolate in cervids, and it is very closely related to manheimia, and many strains are resistant to new floor. Truparella, unlike <clears throat> the last one, is does produce a leukotoxin, an endotoxin, and a capsulary polysaccharide, leading to extreme lung damage. Uh, with the difference with Truparella is you usually see a very short course of disease causing very dramatic lung damage. Other common bacterial isolates in cervids include Pasteurella, Bibirstinia, and Mycoplasma. With all pneumonia with bovine, you always have to remember bovine tuberculosis should be a consideration with any pneumonia. It causes a chronic progressive illness and usually see symptoms like weight loss cough and dyspnea and as with <clears throat> as with cattle you usually see those white granulomatous lesions in the lungs pleura and or the abdomen and just a reminder tuberculosis as we all know is both reportable and zoonotic um, incidentally enough viral pneumonia does not seem to be a common issue in deer like we see it in cattle they're common Thing you'll run into is foot rot and the most common just like pneumonia and is the fusobacterium species as well as the Truparella pyogens. Usually treat with long spectrum antibacterials and sometimes you can use mastitis tubes to treat hoof lesions just like in cattle. Um, prevention is key with foot rot so usually it's looking at your environment 
making sure that it is, they have dry areas to walk on, nothing hard or harsh, uneven to cause abrasions, reducing overcrowding, and some people have had success using FUSO vaccines. Another common thing you may run into is Clostridium perfringens type A. This is a normal inhabitant of the intestinal tract, but it usually ends up over colonizing. It is consistently ubiquitous in the environment, and your most common symptom is sudden death. On necropsy, you would usually see intestinal hemorrhage and splenomegaly as your most common findings. Um, treatment, if you can catch it, is high doses of penicillin and clostridium anatoxins, but most die acutely despite treatment. Again, environmental management is your key to preventing clostridium. Um, prevent soil ingestion, trying to keep the feed off the ground, make sure your environments are clean, and make sure you reduce overcrowding and stress on the deer. Now, vaccination is also helpful. I know the standalone Clostridium A vaccine has been off the market for quite a while, but a lot of cervid vaccines have it in their combo vaccine. Another common thing you will run into is antler infections or antler injuries, um, usually fighting bucks or high stress events where they're running into fences or even just accidents can cause broken antlers. Untreated injuries from the broken velvet can lead to infection and maggots. Uh, broken antlers can quickly escalate into sepsis as the velvet has a very high blood flow. Treatment usually involves amputating the antler below the injury and leaving enough velvet to close. You can also use silver spray and or screw room spray to prevent maggots, and you want to make sure to treat with long-acting antibiotics and have proper pain management on board. <clears throat> I'll just hit the highlights, and Shelly went over this very well. Here's a picture of those tiny biting midges, and as she said, summer and fall tend to be the most common times you will see EHD. Usually most die within 36 hours of presentation. You see the drooling, swelling of the tongue, severe edema of the head and neck. Um, there's usually three phases, but if they do survive to that final chronic phase, they have poor, poor body conditions, chronic diarrhea, usually sloughed hoofs, vasculitis, and abortions. If they do survive and make it to the chronic stage, they're usually chronic poor doers. They never really recover from that. And as Shelly said, there's several known strains of EHD, but there is little to no cross protection seen, which is another factor with what she was talking about with, hey doc, I vaccinated, but I still got it. That's likely because there's only a few vaccine strains available. I first, well, last time I checked, only one, two, and six have vaccines created for them. And so if you vaccinate with strain one, but this year it happens to be strain two, your deer don't have any protection. And then diagnosis of EHD, typically the spleen is the preferred organ for virus isolation, but you can also submit lung, brain, liver, whole blood, or serum. And with EHD, as we talked about the midges, the vector control is key. You want to eliminate wet and swampy areas. As Shelly said, pastures can stay infected for up to 15 or even longer years, even when you take the deer off. And it does, the prion itself binds tightly to soil and remains infectious and in once it's bound, it's not, you can't really unbind it. Um, deer shed the prions in their blood, their urine, their feces, and their antler velvet, and they're not always symptomatic before they start shedding prions. So the classic image of the poor doing chronic wasting, they might be already shedding when they're in their healthy form when they're first exposed. And something to note about the safety of hunter harvested CWD deer, not that we have that in Indiana yet, but prions have been found in the skeletal muscles, the fat, the heart muscle, the blood and lymphoid tissue. So it is quite well throughout the entire carcass. Um, to date, CWD is not naturally documented in any other species, but there have been a lot of studies looking in primates and the potential for CWD as a model for human exposure. Um, there was one study out of Canada that looked at injecting macaque monkeys 
and they were fed the infected tissues back in 2006. And then in 2019, they were euthanized and examined. And the monkeys that were fed the in tissues were found to have developed low level infections of CWD. Um, at this time, this study has not yet been peer reviewed, but there are many other studies that but they are continuing to look into research. Um, on the other hand, there have been other several other studies looking at monkeys and the potential for CWD transmission, and those studies have not found anything. So definitely an area that further research needs to be in. Now, something I did come across recently, a study out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison has found the evidence that ticks can harbor transmissible amounts of chronic wasting disease prions. Um, their research showed that ticks carry enough of the agent to potentially affect deer, be it either via inject ingestion when they're grooming themselves or the ticks themselves taking blood meals. This study only showed that the ticks harbor the CWD prions. It did not show if it was possible for the ticks to transmit the CWD prions back to the deer. So that is definitely an area of further research that we can continue to look at. Next, I wanted to go over SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the OIE released a statement back in 2021, and they said recent scientific research has shown a high prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 infection with white-tailed deer populations in North America. This is the first time that the virus had been detected at a population levels in wildlife. This discovery requires further research to determine if white-tailed deer could become a reservoir of SARS-CoV-2 and to assess other animals for public health implications. As they do not show any clinical signs of infection, white-tailed deer should be monitored for the possibility of becoming a silent reservoir. So I did wanna go over three different studies. The first one was by the USDA and Cornell, and they specifically looked at susceptibility of white-tailed deer to SARS-CoV-2. The reason they chose white-tailed deer was because they have they have an ACE2 protein similar to humans that have a high binding probability to SARS-CoV-2. This specific study inoculated six-week-old fawns with intranasal strains of SARS-CoV-2, and they were then observed for 21 days. The fawns in observation developed no clinical signs, but viral RNA was found in their fecal and nasal secretion samples. This study also showed indirect transmission from the inoculated deer to the non-inoculated deer, as you can see by this image. Um, this is the setup that they had. They had the inoculated deer on the right-hand side and then the contact deer on the left-hand side. They separated the two populations by a plexiglass panel. The deer were not able to have any nose-to-nose -nose contact, but they did share air. And um, the study found that even the contact deer that were non-inoculated had RNA sample, samples in their secretions as well. On same study, the necropsy findings showed high viral loads in the nasal tur turbinates, the palatine tonsils, and the medial retropharyngeal lymph nodes. And these sites served as potential replication sites for SARS-CoV-2, which confirmed the potential replication was in the upper respiratory system, which is what they were suspecting suspecting in deer. Interestingly, the SARS-CoV-2 RNA virus was never found in the deer lung tissue. Um, as I said, there was no direct nose-to-nose -nose contact between the inoculated and non-inoculated deer, but the non-inoculated were also had the RNA virus in their nasal secretion and fecal samples, suggesting an aerialization spread in deer, just like how SARS-CoV-2 was spread in humans. The next study was by USDA APHIS, which confirmed that SARS-CoV-2 antibodies in free-ranging white deer populations in Illinois, Michigan, New York, and Pennsylvania. They collected 481 samples in wild deer between January of 2020 and March of 2021. The results were as followed. 101 samples in Illinois, 7% were positive. In Michigan, 67% of the 113 samples were positive. In New York, there were 19% of the 68 samples were positive. And in Pennsylvania, 31% of the 999 samples were positive. 
Um, in this study, the SARS-CoV-2 commercially available antibody screening tests were used and they were <clears throat> They were highly specific in several other species, but they hadn't specifically been verified in deer yet. Um, <clears throat> the tests used were highly specific for SARS-CoV-2, and the tests themselves were not known to cross-react with any other viruses. To confirm, they did run additional secondary testing at APHIS's National Veterinary Services Laboratory in Ames, Iowa, for confirmation, and both tests had identical findings. The screening tests were positive and the secondary tests were positive for SARS-CoV-2. Um, note that the test only looked for antibodies, so active infections could not be confirmed. The test only showed exposure to the virus in the deer. The final COVID study I wanted to talk about was out of Texas A&M University. Um, they showed that naturally infected white-tailed deer can harbor antibody titers for SARS-CoV-2 for up to 13 months. <clears throat> A&M actually used a current ongoing deer herd study for an anthrax vaccine and a fever tick vaccine study. And they ser the study itself had serum samples taken across several time points between 2020 and March of 2022. And when Texas A&M added on the SARS-CoV-2 sampling, they also did respiratory and rectal swabs at the final two time points of the study. Um, the serum samples were tested for SARS-CoV-2 by plague reduction neutralization tests, and the rectal and respiratory swabs were tested by PCR. Out of the 21 does enrolled in the study, they all tested negative for SARS-CoV-2 between November and December of 2020. By the end, by January of 2021, all does had tested positive. And throughout the entire study, the majority of does remained seropositive to SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing antibodies all the way up through March of 22 at the end of the study. Out of the 21, two of them were were seronegative by July and September of 2022. This final study showed that white-tailed deer have the potential to harbor SARS-CoV-2 for at least 13 months. It is suggestive that other white-tailed deer, that white-tailed deer might have the potential to become amplifying hosts for SARS-CoV-2 in nature. And then, although no risk to humans from deer have been shown yet, the potential may be there for deer to continue spreading in different locations. Uh, currently, APHIS is working closely with federal and state partners to continue these research projects, and they've gotten funding for more similar projects. Many of these studies, these new studies, will rely heavily on hunter harvested deer, which can be sampled alongside CWD test stations. Um, continued studies with captive deer herds are also planned in individual states. And finally, I did want to discuss Asian longhorned ticks not necessarily for the disease potential to deer, but more for the deer's role in spreading Asian longhorn ticks. Um, <clears throat> so Asian longhorn ticks were first reported in the U.S. in 2017, and they're currently been reported in 19 different U.S. states, including Indiana, which we had our first identification back in May. Um, two, long, two nymphal longhorn tips ticks were found on a routine surveillance drag by an entomologist in the southern county of Switzerland. Um, a side note about Asian longhorn ticks is female ticks are capable of laying 1,000 to 2,000 eggs without mating with the male, which <clears throat> is significant. Um, Asian longhorn ticks are carriers of bovine filariosis, babesiosis, and recent, one recent study has shown they also have the potential to carry Rocky, spotted, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And as I said, the biggest risk, known risk at the moment for deer is that they're capable of transporting ticks to new locations, aiding in the continued spread of Asian longhorn ticks in the United States. That is all I had. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Glom. That was a fantastic presentation. We really appreciate um, you and Dr. Chavis joining us today. Um, at this point in time, while Dr. Glom is taking a quick break for water, um, this is the ideal time to submit any comments or questions you have in the chat box. 
um, please direct them to everyone um, or BOA in the chat section and we'll do our best to answer them. You can also raise your hand and we will unmute you. All right. Well, it sounds like you guys both covered everything that you needed to about deer. So thank you very much all for your participation. Um, and thank you for joining. You will be receiving continuing education credit for this webinar via email in the coming week. So keep an, a lookout for that. And otherwise, um, thank you all for joining. Just have a quick question. Can we get the slides from today? We can. We can. Yep. We can send, sorry, just double checking here in the room. Um, we can get the slides from today to all of you, um, likely with the continuing ed credit um, that we send out. We'll send them both out at the same time. Thank you for your question. And then we'll also have the video posted in case anyone is interested um, in the coming weeks on our uh, YouTube channel. All right, thank you all for joining. Have a great day.